Um, thank you all for coming. My name is Diane DiNapoli. I'm a Hingham resident and the former co-chair of the Hingham CPAC and the Hingham CARES member. And currently, I'm the stat liaison to the Hingham Police. But most importantly, I am the mother of two children with special needs. I want to thank you all for coming to this presentation. Um, the connection between the substance abuse and special needs is something that's very dear to my heart. Um, as cultural norms change and there's changing attitudes around substance use, I think it's critical to arm parents with information, correct information, um, in a timely manner that our kids can understand. Um, I'd like to thank SNAP and Hingham Cares for their generous support of this event. I'd also like to recognize members of the CARES board who are here tonight, Kristen Root, who's done a fabulous job um, running CARES. Uh, Lori was not here tonight, but she's fabulous. Um, I'd also like to um, acknowledge some other people in the room. Uh, it would really be a, a miss to not acknowledge um, our Hingham Police Force. Um, Colin Olson, as mo Chief Olson, sorry, as most of you know, his steadfast loyalty to the special needs community is just really amazing. Um, in September, Chief also named Dan Murphy, who is here tonight. Dan, you want to wave? <laughs> Dan Murphy is a special needs officer, and I have to applaud uh, Officer Murphy for his drive and compassion to serving our community. All the members of the Hingham Police will be receiving ALEC, which is Autism Law Enforcement Coalition training in February. I believe this demonstrates Chief Olson's deep commitment to enriching and empowering not only his own police force, but improving the lives of all those with autism in Hingham. On March 3rd, SNAP and the Hingham Police will host a sensory-friendly tour of the police department. This will give families and kids the opportunity to come in and get a better understanding of how policing works in Hingham. And it'll be a great way to, for parents to better understand the partnership between SNAP and the Hingham Police Department. To say I am immensely proud of the Hingham Police efforts to support our community would be an understatement. Thank you, Chief, uh, Chief. Thank you, Officer Murphy, Officer Ford, and Officer Ramsey for their hard work, dedication, and your willingness to walk the path with the, those in the special needs community. Okay, now that that Oscar part is over and I didn't cry, I'm gonna, <laughs> I would also like to acknowledge some other special people here tonight. Um, Obviously, Plymouth County District Attorney Tim Cruz is here. Thank you for coming. Joan Machino, our state rep, is here. Okay, I'm trying to see. Paul Gannon, former selectman, is here. Thank you very much. He is also the founder of Hingham Cares. And I am terribly sorry if I missed anybody. You can yell at me later. Um, I'd like to give Tim Cruz a couple of minutes and Joan a couple of minutes to speak, but I'd also like to introduce and give a little flow of how this night's going to work because it's a little unusual. Um, Dr. Murphy, who is a, earned his uh, doctorate degree from Northeastern, he is a teacher, a presenter, and runs his own consulting firm, which you can see, you can line on, log on here, Effective Effort Consulting. He's keenly aware of the social emotional needs of our children, and he is truly a wonderful person and a joy to work with. His energy and passion are just tr tremendous. Um, Dr. Murphy's presentation will run about half an hour and we can ask questions. I strongly encourage you if something, you know, this is a lot to cover in one night, so we'll be posting it, but please ask questions. Um, after that, we will have um, one of the Hingham Police Department members will kind of go over some of the what to look for, some of the paraphernalia. Please ask questions. Don't feel embarrassed. Trust me, if you don't know what it is, probably none of us know what it is. And then Mary Savage Dunham. Uh, we'll speak a little about the town warrants that will be coming forth in Hingham uh, in respect to marijuana in the town. So it's a lot to cover, and I really look forward to you having questions. And if we have questions that are not answered, um, Kristen will circulate with a little sticky pad. If it's something you don't want to ask in a group or it's just something that comes to mind, write it down, put your email, and we will get back to you. I will take onus on getting back to everybody, so please ask your questions. Um, I'd like to now turn the floor over to um, District Attorney Cruz, if you'd like to say a couple words, and then Joan Machino will briefly speak. <coughs> Thanks so much. I, I'll, be, I'll be brief because we have obviously great speakers here tonight to learn a little bit about something which is not as usual as I normally see in my role as district attorney. Um, I, I really appreciate the collaboration between the different groups that are here this evening and the real challenges that we're all facing uh, in, the, in this world right now. I, I really don't think, you know, our kids nowadays, kids 
are facing challenges that we never faced growing up. We're dealing now with, a, with obviously a opiate struggles and the various drugs and synthetics that are out there and the challenges that are there. And the, the fentanyl and the carfentanyl uh, is unprecedented. And notwithstanding the efforts of a lot of good people, like the Hingham Police, Chief Olson, notwithstanding the efforts of a lot of good faith-based people that are working together with groups and trying to get in front of this problem, to me, it still seems a little bit like one step forward and two steps back because of the fact we're not getting ahead of it. But that's not for lack of effort. And that's why I commend each and every one of you, you for coming out here tonight and listening and learning a little bit more about you know, what we can do to try to help our children, uh, the, the special needs children here in our community, as well as all of our children. What I see in the criminal justice system is we unfortunately turn into a depository for a lot of problems that are left and ignored in our community. Whether it be drugs and the people who are addicted to drugs, mental health issues, we end up seeing in the court system people all fall in to the court system, which quite honestly is not set to help people in that fashion. So therefore, I think when we see our sheriff down in, down the jail trying to put together reentry programs, trying to work together and get information, how do you look at this problem from a big circle, everybody together? Because one entity is not going to be in a position to change it. Educating our kids, protecting our kids, that's got to be first and foremost. Helping the people that we can help that are out there that are using these drugs. Stopping the cycle of drugs. And what, what I'm seeing also, unfortunately, what I'm really concerned about is in our world, in the, in the world of criminal justice, when you're dealing with cycles of domestic violence or child abuse, it's not unusual to see the people who were the victims, the little kids, turn into those problems. We're looking at drug-endangered kids now. Kids who are losing their parents, kids who are out there in the world right now being taken care of by their grandparents who really aren't co able to cope with the problems that the kids face. It's a true problem. And we have to get in front of that and stop the cycle. The thing that gives me hope is going across our county, talking to lots of people everywhere, and working together. And that's why I'm glad I could be here tonight. I appreciate your efforts in being in here. Let's all work together. I truly believe that, you know, it, as we proceed down this road that is challenging, I truly believe that we will get in front of this problem and someday these will all be bad memories and we can continue to work together to help our children make it the, the great community that it is and that it can even be better. So thanks so much for having me tonight and good luck. Thank you so much. I'm your state representative, Joan Moschino, and I'm delighted to be here tonight um, look, just echoing um, our district attorney's remarks. Um, thank you. Thank you all as a community. Um, as you heard, um, this problem has grown geometrically um, by leaps and bounds, really, and I think a lot of the solutions start here with the community and the work that you're doing right now together. And so I would just want to say thank you to the district attorney for his leadership. Uh, thank you to the partnerships that are growing here and have knit together, not even just within Hingham, but um, you know I see Cohasset, uh, Chris Murphy here as well, across uh, our whole district. And it's through those kinds of supports and initiatives and education of the community and investments, that's really in the core community, that's where we're going to start to solve this problem. So I just want to thank you all and as your state representative, I am here for you uh, for whatever legislative initiatives and solutions uh, come out of these initiatives. Um, we're here for you. This is something that the Speaker of the House takes very seriously. Um, he's mentioned it in his remarks. They've taken a lot of strides, um, but the innovations start here, and we're here to support you. And just thank you again for all of your good work. Good night. Okay, and I did forget somebody, and I do apologize. We have school committee member Ed Schreier, Dr. Schreier, and Dr. Gallo. I don't know where she is, but thank you so much for your dedication to our, all our children, but especially our special needs children. Um, with that, I would like to end. Carlos, I'm sorry I didn't see you. Carlos De Silver, sorry. I, I really can't see without my glasses, so I'm going to blame that if I miss anyone else. Um, Dr. Murphy, I'd like to now uh, turn the table over to you, floor over to you. Thank you so much. My, my intention was really simple, and that is to leave us with. Okay, is that better? Is to leave us asking the right questions and better questions, okay? So that we can leave here empowered to solve a very, very complex problem with a very, very fragile population. Okay, so uh, that required 
uh, a tremendous many, many hours to try to fill what I needed to into a 30-minute presentation. So uh, this was hard. <laughs> this was the hardest presentation I've had to prepare for. Uh, so, um, and like Diane said, um, a little bit about me. So I run a private practice in the South Shore. Um, I do that as my, um, you know, side job in a, in a sense. I'm a full-time teacher. Uh, in Duxbury um, as a special ed teacher 20 plus years uh, dealing with issues head on and then at night I go into the homes and work with parents I go into the homes work with kids on solving very complex needs related to ADHD and executive function deficits so I work on uh, so as you talk about this drug drug use and the substance abuse you're talking about looking at it at, at symptom, right, as you go through the continuum of special ed or, or the umbrella of what risk factors are associated and where the problems can persist to the point where we're in crisis. So, um, sorry. Okay. Uh, but I don't just come at this as a professional, right? So I come at this also as a parent. So I can't wait to end my part of the presentation and put take off one hat and put on the other and do and really try to get out of this also as a parent committed vested and trying to solve the same problems that you are um, and quick overview so I'm gonna really cover uh, six frames in this we're gonna look at substance use risk factors trends in substance use we're gonna look at substance use disorder as it's operationally defined trends in special ed risk factors within special education, and then proactive parent strategies. Okay, by that point, we're gonna have a lot of questions, but then I'm gonna bring up the panel. And because these questions are gonna drive right down into what do we do in Hingham, okay? Uh, so, I'm sorry for the delay with this. I'm not sure what's going on here. Um, substance use risk factors. There are three components to, when we think about substance use risk factors, there are three domains. One's family, one's individual, and one is peers. And when you think of family, think of the tree, right? Don't think of the child in this case, but think of the tree. And think of aspects related to, so we think of parenting drug, uh, parental drug use, favorable uh, factors as it relates to parents and drug use. You talk about marital conflicts being risk factors, family dysfunction, substance use among siblings. <clears throat> oh, that's so annoying, I'm sorry. I'm not a podium person, so I try to not be behind a podium. Prenatal exposure, negative life events, and Poor parenting styles. Now, poor parenting is, is really as it relates to operational definition of it, but poor parenting styles, and obviously all of these can be related to styles that may lead to or be uh, possible risk factors. So harsh discipline, permissive discipline, lack of or inconsistent discipline, inadequate supervision or monitoring, child abuse, and maltreatment. Individual risk factors. So this is when we think about the child. Right? And we think about your child, whoever you have in your head here today, early onset of aggressive or problem behaviors. Difficult temperament, low mood, low self-esteem, sensation seeking, poor impulse control. Now, I'm just talking about risk factors in the general population, but you're thinking of your child who has special needs. And I'm not even there yet. Keep that in mind. Other individual risk factors. Poor grades, right, underachieving. Poor social skills and poor social problem solving skills. Learning disabilities in relation to coexisting conditions. And cognitive impairments. All of these being possible risk factors. Now let's look at the peer groups. Deviant peer groups, peer attitudes towards substance use, peers that use substance use, social adversity, right? And attending college. 
I thought it was just kind of different item on the list. So what are the trends? So I'm going to start to, OK, so as we look at like a risk factors overall, let's look at what the trends are showing on a national level. All right, we're going to go back to 2017, back to last year. And what I try to pull out of the data is I try to pull out information that I, as a parent, would want to see that might be relevant to me today in Hingham. Okay, this is a lot of data to comb through. So I thought, as a quick snapshot, what can you take away? Marijuana continues to climb in its use. And this study was looked at 8th graders, 10th graders, and 12th graders on a national level. And marijuana continues to be, uh, continues to climb in its use. Vaping, it's the new delivery drug, it's the new delivery device. And it is climbing at a rapid rate. Inhalants, decreased on all grades except eighth graders. That should tr spark some questions as to why. Cigarette smoking continues to decline. And binge drinking had been on the decline, but has stopped declining. And you have a steady trend where you have 4% of 8th graders, 10% of 10th graders, and 17% of 12th graders engaging in binge drinking. Let's go back to 2017. <laughs> I like this study because Perception matters. And this study looks at beliefs about harmfulness around certain drugs. Now this, is, this is a long list, and you can't really see it from back there, so I blew it up for us. But what it shows is, you know, from what drugs, maybe do they fear the most, right? Which ones are they, they feel is most harmful? and which ones are least harmful. Marijuana being at the bottom of the list. What I find interesting is when you look at the 50% range, you have cocaine, narcotics in that list. But this is an interesting slide that should lead to uh, other questions around why. why. Why aren't most of them up at the 70% range? Why are kids not afraid of these drugs? Clinically, how do you know your child may have a substance use disorder? And that's when you can do, so DSM-5 would um, you know, say this. <clears throat> you need two or more of the following conditions within a 12-month period. often taken in large amounts than intended, unsuccessful effort to cut or control the use, cravings, failure to fulfill major role obligations, persistent social interpersonal problems, occupation, recreation, activities are given up. You just stop doing what you love. Re re Recurrent use in physically hazardous situations. I just think of driving. Continued use despite knowledge of having a concurrent physical or psychiatric problem that may be the result of that dependency. And then you have tolerance and withdrawal. Two or more factors within a 12-month period. You now have what you would clinically define as a substance use disorder. Now, let's look at special education and see what comparisons exist. One in five children across America have a learning and attentional issues. Keep in mind the intentional piece. We're going to come back to this. <clears throat> when you look at th uh, from uh, three-year-old to, to 21, you can see where the prevalence exists. <laughs> where 35% have a specific learning disability, 20% have a speech and language impairment, and then 30% other health impairments, and the percentage goes down from there. 
But that's not necessarily as interesting as when you think of coexisting conditions. A child with a learning disability is twice as likely as a member of the general population to suffer attention deficit disorder. So I don't like that other slide because it doesn't factor in coexisting conditions. Right? And it's the coexisting conditions that can lead to untreated children. Flip it, and you have one-third of children diagnosed with ADHD have one or more of these coexist coexisting conditions. So when I talk about trends in ADHD, I don't see ADHD children, right? I see coexisting conditions untreated. Because in my practice, that's what I see all the time anyways. But it's nice to see that the research agrees with me. Now, just to make it a little bit more complicated to think about the life of a child with special needs, and maybe they have a coexisting condition, so they're not just dealing with a learning disability, but they are struggling with attentional issues, self-regulation issues. Can you imagine they also have developmental delay related to social and emotional interactions with their peers? I wonder why homework's so hard. 10-year-old ADHD operates at the maturity level of a 7-year-old, yet they pass the license test, they get a car, and the rest is history, but not so much. Risk factors relates to ADHD. This isn't drug-related, but it is worth sharing. Traffic, more likely to have traffic citations, more likely to get in a second car accident, and more likely to have your license suspended or revoked. Teens with ADHD, more likely skip school, drop out, suspended, or have to repeat a year. Are you starting to make some connections between risk factors related to substance abuse and the data you're seeing here in relation to special ed. You should be. Because there is correlation. This was a meta, this was a systemic review or meta-analysis of 27 longitudinal studies. I don't know, the people, the researchers in the room are like, whoa, because that's <laughs> big, right? And the conclusion isn't too far off what you may assume, but this is the conclusion, that there is evidence of increased risks of using nicotine, alcohol use disorder, marijuana use, marijuana use disorder, cocaine use, general illicit drug use. But I have to add a caveat here because, of course, ADHD isn't existing as itself. It's a typically, I would say, by default, treated as a coexisting condition. And in this case, this research study had to put, this isn't a fair study if you don't put in the caveat here, and that is must factor in coexisting conditions of conduct disorder and oppos oppositional defiant disorder, or or. Now, this is a, a transition slide that's going to lead into what to do, right? But at the heart of it is you have, you, is, is you may have children that fall under this special education umbrella that inherently struggle with self-regulation of thought, of mood, and behavior. and therefore find themselves searching and in a states of dysregulation leading down risky behaviors and risky actions. Difficulty regulating their thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Now, to me as a practitioner out in the field, 
that hits me harder than anything. And I spend all of my energy on answering that problem right there and helping children develop regulation skills in thoughts, feelings, and emotions, and behaviors. Because that is what starts to lead them and maintain their efforts in a positive and productive direction. Self-regulation deficit, maybe? This is the pod, Tide Pod Challenge. If you don't know what it is, just Google it on YouTube, and you'll catch up to where your kids are. Not whether or not they're doing it, they just know about it. Um, I did ask if this is happening in Hingham, and I heard that there's no evidence of it yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they, they take Tide Pod things, and they put them in their mouth, and they chew them, right? It's, and then they video record it, and they post it. It's, a, it's the thing to do. Um, yeah. So, what do we do? What do we do? Well, I'm assuming that we're not going to get the answer up here by me, right? But I'm going to tell you clinically what the suggestions are that we do and get us framing out next steps with a clear idea of what best practices are. And then we're going to look at what's going on in Hingham and what to do in Hingham. Okay? But out of all of the research and all of the evidence I was, I was piling through, I put this statement on the front because it resonate, It should resonate with all parents that after school hours are the most dangerous time for tweens and teens to be on their own. Right? So you start to let your mind kind of go to that time period and say, what, what can I do about that? may be the best place to start. So get involved is kind of a, a, a summary of all of this. Get involved with your children's lives. Get involved, get involved, get involved, get involved. Yeah, but it's obtrusive. Yes, get involved. Know their locations. Know their friends. Know their plans. I know. They're going to tell you it's obtrusive. Get out of my life. Right? <clears throat> Limit the time your child spends without adult supervision. Learn the technology your teen is using and use it. Right? I, I, for most of us, that's, that can be a pretty significant learning curve because it changes every day. But I'm not saying you need to be up on the newest app, right? but you should be involved. And you cannot parent the way you were parented. Okay? So think of how your parents parented you, and then don't do that. Okay? And then, and then say, what should I do? Because for one thing, your child should only be in their bedroom to do one thing, and that's sleep, if you want to start anywhere. Why? because they can take every dark alley on the planet into their bedroom with them. And you couldn't do that when you were a kid. So you just think about how to drastically shift my perception of how to keep my child safe. I'll start to figure out what the answers are. <clears throat> that was an environmental change. Behavioral therapy and environmental changes to shape the behaviors of our children. Now, this is with or without special needs, okay? Right? But best practices that we should do, I don't care who your child is, these are best practices. And I'm adding to it because the best practices can't even keep up with the trends in technology and what's going on today. Maintain a daily, daily schedule. Know your child's schedule. If they don't have one, make one for them. And say, here's your schedule. I love you. <laughs> Keep distractions to a minimum. Now, I love that. But here's what that means. Right now, social media is louder than you are. OK? So when they have a decision to make, guess who they're not listening to in their ear? Mom and dad are not on their shoulder. 
because the distractions in their life are louder than you are. So you have to find a way to become louder. And I'm not saying discipline. I'm just saying be present, be involved, be proactive, and be louder than the technology and the social media and the bombardment of being a teenager today. Provide logical space for your child to keep their school right. Just help create structure in their life. Physical. Because have you ever seen a, 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 a messy room? Does it feel good? No. So children with special needs struggle all day long. And then they come home. And you need to provide evidence of where structure can exist, where therapeutic environments can exist, where they can find a way of just finding a place to decompress. And if they walk into a home that's as chaotic as the school life they live, you're just helping to perpetuate a belief cycle in their head that they are in total chaos. Provide, uh, um, set small and reachable goals. This has everything to do with expectations. If you want my first suggestion on how to be louder than them, my first suggestion is write down your expectations. Just have a, some kids just have a dialogue and you form it into a paragraph and then you have everybody sign it. it says, this is our expectations of you. This is, your, this is your expectations you have of us as parents. Now we have a roadmap. We have a clear defined set of rules of engagement of what we as your parents want for you as our child. Um, reward positive behavior. Uh, this is this is the opposite of nagging. Okay, so they use you know we know what nagging is. Nagging is when you chronically see something that you don't like and you just complain about it repeatedly until it changes. And when it doesn't change, obviously you have something called nagging. Changing that story by setting expectations and rules and daily schedules and really clear, defined plan for your child's day, you can start to create positive behavioral rewards that promote. Now, this is really just to help them break the cycle of negative self-thought, negative self-identity, and to help them start to create positive life patterns. Um, charts and checklists. Checklists are awesome. Uh, limit choices. Uh, in a society where there is limitless choices, it is not a bad idea to just simplify their life, right? And start to really quiet and calm the choices that they have in front of them. They don't have to do everything. Find positive activities. This I hear as build their strengths. Find what they're good at. Find what they're passionate about. Right? Dr. Um, uh, Hallowell would call it uh, cognitive strengths. It's their innate interests and start to expand upon them. In the chaos of being a child with special needs and the struggles, nobody lets them know what they're good at. Everybody lets them know what they're not good at. And then they get the grades to prove it and they have the nagging parents to prove it. Focus on what they're good at. and Give them a roadmap towards building that strength into a career. And the hardest one of all is stay calm and consistent. It's hard, but if you start at the top and work your way down, by the time you get to the bottom, it's actually easier. Because you've done a lot of other things right, so you're not Constantly berserko, yeah. <clears throat> I, I took a, a couple of statements from the earlier slide that I've, uh, but to reiterate, <clears throat> their striving instincts is that cognitive strength. It's that innate ability. What are they good at? Now I see too many kids forced through the educational systems, and they should be at a Vogue school. You know why they should be at a Vogue school? because they're amazing with their hands. And everybody thinks they need to graduate from a regular high school. Guess who lost out and is still searching 
for what they're good at. Right? So pay attention to what they're good at. And don't project your identity on them. Let them decide. Let them be the voice and follow, listen to where their strengths are, be their suggestions, and start to let them move in a direction that truly defines what they're capable of, or else they'll continue to define with what they're not capable of. Mirror traits, hard to do. But if you can catch the moments when you're nagging, that's the moment to say, what am I nagging about? And is this a trait that I can start to define positively? Okay. Oh, yeah, an example. So, well, three would be, you know, stubbornness, right? It's, it's a great example because we think of stubbornness, and from a cognitive perspective, it's known as, you know, rigidity. I want things my way, right? And if I don't get it my way, I'm going to have an adult temper tantrum. I'm talking about the kid, right? Parent, kid, right? Parent, kids. Yeah, so, so the kid will have a, a, a temper tantrum because they didn't get their way because of this rigidity, this stubbornness. Now, I see that as a gift. If it's harnessed and moved in a purposeful direction towards something they're really interested in, right? Because that stubbornness may make a phenomenal entrepreneur that will never give up on their passion, but not if they're treated as being just stubborn and that's negative because you're not doing what I told you to do. Um, create opportunities for connectiveness. Just try. I don't care if it's once a week family dinners because you went from none. If you can get to five, you're a rock star family. I have families that do breakfast because nobody's around at night and they get together every morning for breakfast. Just as hard, because someone has to get up early to make it, right? <laughs> trips, trips without technology, trips without distractions, make that part of the new you. So, I have no idea what time it is. Okay, so I covered, so like I said, I, it was a lot of information. I tried to put in what was going to be relevant to this talk to get you all thinking, and I know I threw a lot at you on a Thursday night at 7.30, right? I expected that. It's online for you to go back to, and I expect you to do that as well. But I want to now get the, the panel, the people in town, the experts in town, Chief Olson, to start to, <laughs> you just got the buck passed here, <laughs> to, to share with you what you can start to listen for. As parents, you're walking through the day of being a parent, what do you listen for? What are the terms that you could start to, you know, that you may not even know exist? Now, you saw that list of, of, of 25 drugs. Well, they all have about 25 different street names that change every day. So this list isn't really that helpful, except to get us starting to think about what do I listen for? And I would refer to, obviously, the community officers to say, this is what I'm hearing. And then what to look for. Do we have my? Uh... So I'm walking into the bathroom at Duxbury High School, and I see this. I waited 10 seconds while he held his breath. <laughs> <laughs> now, if, if, you're not, if, if you don't know what that is, you don't know what just happened. Right? And this is the larger of the versions of, uh, of what a va you know, uh, of of what they vape with. So they can hold, they can conceal that tight, and then their wrist, and it drops down, and they're in their pocket in two seconds. But they're fearless about it, because it is so easy to conceal, right? And as you noticed, it's bottom of the list. I mean, if they're, if, 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 uh, you know, if they're using it for nicotine, if they're using it for marijuana, 
you know, they, they'll figure out a way to do it. And they're not that af it's not a harmful substance from their perspective unless we start to change their belief, right? <clears throat> so what to look for in terms of the, the paraphernalia, but also where is it hidden, right? I'm going to my buddy's house and I have a backpack on. Why do you have a backpack on? Do you own your buddy's house? Are you doing homework together? It's Friday night, <laughs> right? But you know, you, you can just be involved. Uh, the obtrusiveness is 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 looking in their backpack. No, I don't. Of course, I trust you. I trust and verify. <laughs> it's the life of a teacher. We trust and verify. But where is it hidden? You know, this is this is this is when you're at that point where trust is broken down, and I got to start looking, right? And that's that's where we don't want to get to. But if I have to, I have to, because my child's safety comes first. Questions? Yes. Um, back to the um, risk factors, and you know all the. Uh, yeah. Pa parent, child, child, child. So all individual. The, the ADHD, so children with ADHD and, you know, special ed. Um, is that those um, what are they, what are they, um, questionnaires, or were those, yeah. is there a difference between medicated children with ADHD and non-medicated? And is, is that? Yes. If you want best practices of interventions, for ADHD, medication. Now, I don't want to say that because I sound like a pill pusher, right? Medication. Medication, medication. And there is no research findings that says that if I take Ritalin, I am, I am now, a, that is a gateway drug to other substances. The answer is no. Not at all. Especially... I mean, especially with a child that's educated on, on its purpose, its use, and its risk, so right? Percentages and statistics are just in general for kids with like ADHD or special needs that are not treated. So the, the slides that you have in a lot of the- Yeah, so uh, and that's, that's a great question. So they, um, in many of those, that would that would be without treatment. So they'd be talking about, okay, what are the findings when you're diagnosed, right? And if it goes untreated. Now, anything treated is, you know, we're talking about, so I, I knew I'd have to say this. I don't want anybody leaving here afraid for their children because they got diagnosed with ADHD, okay? That's why I was really clear on the coexisting conditions you want to pay attention to. ADHD is a gift, period. How you parent it matters, right? But it's the self-regulation deficits you want to pay very close attention to and help train your child. Yes, medication helps with that condition. Therapy helps with that condition. If your child has a predisposition to be negative and self-deprecating and pessimistic, well, that is one of the risk factors that has nothing to do with being ADHD. That was on slide number three. But sometimes treating the ADHD, you lose sight of that because you're just, because having an ADHD can be kind of chaotic, right? And parenting that can be kind of chaotic, but that can be treated, right? Cognitive behavioral therapy is the second most effective treatment for ADHD and many others and many other conditions, many other. Find your child an amazing therapist that they can build a nice long-term relationship with because you, tr you know, we try to wear every hat we can and then we try the therapy hat. How good does that go? <laughs> Doesn't go well when they reach a certain age and they want nothing to do with you, right? But there was another question. 
Um, what are your recommendations for having proactive discussions with your kids, particularly if they are at a heightened risk for addiction issues? Uh, maybe at a younger age, like say middle school, before substance use has really come into the picture for them. Um, I guess, I mean, I'm, stu I'm stuttering just because I just want to say any conversation you have with your children can never be bad, right? Can never be negative. And the younger you start talking about things has a lot to do with developmental maturity, right? And where that child is and the questions they're asking maybe, what do you find them curious about? But maintaining at a very young age an open dialogue, I ask parents, sit with your kid every night before bed. And when it gets really quiet, listen to what they say. And do that every night until they're no longer in your home. Because in those moments before bed, when the dust has settled and there's no more distractions, you get some really cool questions. But that you don't get them if you're not there. And if you haven't fostered that kind of relationship. Right? And I'm saying it like it's easy. I know it's not. But it doesn't mean you stop or you, don't, or you give up. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Yeah, I, mean, I, was, I was thinking even more specifically about drugs and alcohol, if there's um, things you recommend about engaging your kids about that topic and about their increased risk. Yeah, so I, I, think, uh, I think treating anything as taboo starts to treat, uh, tries to treat it as a, as a, um, as a um, secret. Right? And I don't think it, it's not. I think the more transparent you are about substance use, even in your own family, right? Mom and dad drink, and here's, you know, and, and here's, here's how we do it. Here's how we don't do it. Right? If you just get to the family of things, start chipping away at the family risk factors and have conversations around what your children see when they go to family parties. If you ignore that, then that could be just as big of a problem as talking about it. But I say talking about it, you, you're never, you're, you're never going to lose. I don't know how, how young, you're never going to lose. I mean, it almost goes with the same conversation around sex, right? It's like, when do I talk about sex and birds and the bees? Well, there's a developmental aspect of it. There's a parent comfort level to it when they want to start, right? And there's also keeping the conversation open and starting as early as you can. Question. I have a lot to say. I was ready to jump out of my skin, but I wanted to address your, um, I am Chris Murphy, and I founded the Safe Harbor Coalition Against Substance Abuse in Cohasset, and I would tell you that the earlier you have these discussions with your children, the better. Your kids need to know if there's family um, substance use or any sort of gambling addiction, any sort of addiction is a, would, um, you know, give them more of a predisposition towards this. So, I would strongly encourage early and often, and I would also encourage, we're focusing on in Cohasset is getting to the kids before there's any experimentation. And the experimentation starts around between seventh and eighth grade. So if you can get your fourth and fifth grade kids and have the discussion and have, oh, there's a parenting tool kit on NIDA that uh, Kristen has that uh, we, we go through, and there's a lot of things, but I would say early and often. The other thing I wanted to say here is you're talking to somebody that has uh, ADHD, wild ADHD, was a super high achiever. My son uh, had it, has, uh, was born with ADHD. He was my only son for nine years. He was in three day, uh, two daycare centers, one Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, one Tuesday and Thursday, and I had a babysitter meet him after the daycare center. He came home with a note pinned to him and it said this is his last day with a cut under his eye and that was that was it. But I will tell you right now, my son is, um, he was medicated. He is doing terrifically well. He works at the, in the family office at Fidelity and he manages, uh, works with people that have $100 million or more. So I want everybody in this room to understand if your child is afflicted with ADHD, it is a gift as long as we really it gets treated and we work hard hard with it but I, I i just want people to have hope and faith that um i don't look at it as an affliction i look at it as a real positive thing and we made it in our family so you can too mm -hmm. by the way their father was a heroin addict so um and died of an overdose so i just 
want you to understand there wasn't there was a lot of negatives in the household that, that we grew in and I, I was the breadwinner in the family. Thank you for sharing. Chief, you want to speak? I know you I know I just want to hand the mic to you and give you a chance to yeah. Uh, before, before you uh, run out the back door. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, hi everyone. Thank you for coming here tonight. What I actually wanted to do is um, I sit all day in my office, I look out a window, it, my, my world looks wonderful. Um, you know, I like to get out to these things, but I think I would like to have Tom Ford, Rob Ramsey, and Dan Murphy up here, because they're the, they're the ones that see this all the day, they're seeing the stuff in the schools, they're seeing it out on the shifts and everything. Um, I, the only thing I did want to mention to you, because I know this will feed into Mary's presentation later, um, I had some pictures of nice food back at the table back there. These are all products that they're marketing over at the Quincy um, marijuana, uh, medical marijuana. I only brought 10 of these from Ermont is the name of the company over there in Quincy. Read through these. You'll notice the percentage of the THC in some of these products is 85%. Um, you know, this is, I keep on telling people, this is not the stuff that you we may have grown up with or seen when we were older, our generation. This, this is a marketing thing. It's not only being marketed as food and products, it's also being marketing in the clothing industry. Um, and we as adults and parents need to watch what your kids are wearing because they're wearing stuff that are associated with gangs, they're wearing stuff that are associated with drug use, and you won't even know it. So you really need to start educating yourself to those kind of things when you're looking. And if you see a kid wearing those and some of these stuff, they're also probably participating in some of those stuff. So Tom and guys, you want to step forward? Get rid of that mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, just to answer the, the woman's question about um, how early it is to talk, uh, the DARE program at Hingham, we actually start with the fifth grade in the spring. We talk about nicotine dangers, but it really, uh, my core is with the sixth graders, and then I touch again with the seventh and eighth graders. Uh, there really isn't any age not to start. I think the younger they know about it, the better. I mean, at home, I have a, a seventh grader and a third grader. My third grader asks more questions about drugs than the seventh grader does. Um, and so I'm honest with them. You know, I see the dangers of it and everything else like that. Uh, what we're seeing really here in Hingham, uh, the uptake, is uh, with the vaping. Um, the big focus for me is really nicotine, alcohol, and marijuana. Uh, you know, we have a massive opioid go epidemic right now in our area. No one's going to wake up tomorrow morning and say, hey, heroin seems like a great idea. You know, let me find a needle, let me inject it into a vein, let's have a great time with it. Uh, I try to catch it before it gets to that point, which is why I focus on those gateway drugs. Um, because what happens in most cases, in fact, I actually arrested a guy a couple years ago uh, for heroin possession. On the way back to the station, he, he, was, he broke down and told me his whole story. Uh, he, was in, he, he was in high school uh, at, a, at an underage drinking party. And while the influence of alcohol, someone gave him a pill. I forget what pill he started with, but that pill led to a stronger pill, which led to a stronger pill. And before I know he's doing Oxycontins, which can be very expensive on the, on the street. And an average Oxycontin goes anywhere between uh, 80 to 100, and 100 bucks. Um, couldn't afford it. Jumped to the heroin, because today's heroin in, uh, right now in our area is uh, much stronger than it was back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, it's so strong nowadays, you can start snorting it and got hooked on the heroin and then eventually, uh, you know, got caught with it when I caught him. Um, so like I said, that's kind of what I focus with and that's what you should really focus with your kids. Um, any questions at all, please feel free to ask. Um, I have a ton of stuff with me that I'm happy to show everyone after the presentation or, or whatever the case may be. I would yes, ma'am. Are you seeing more use in prescription drugs, like just in Adderall, like kids that are on Adderall that have access to it, that are maybe selling an Adderall pill to somebody at school or? Like in more in the colleges, like is that? Yeah, I'd say high school and college, not so much the middle school level because the parents are really kind of on top of them. You know, high school they get a little more freedom. Um, I Tom could probably answer the question what's going on in the high school trends, um, but I'll let you, Tom take it. Sure. Yeah. Um, again, um, my name's Tom Ford. I've been at the high school for six years, and um, yeah, the, the trend with the high school is um, with the prescription medications. The kids are pretty open when they, when I ask them and we have these discussions. Um, they they have been known to sell their their medication Adderall, and the kids will say around um, like mid years finals when kids need to stay up or they need more energy to uh, to study. They say they'll they'll sell their pills, uh, like for five dollars, ten dollars, and so that's been a um, 
it's not um, it's not something that's really um, prevalent. Something, but it, it happens. The issues that we're having now at the high school, alcohol, is a big one. Um, the cultural attitude towards um, drinking to the kids, it's not a big deal. And today, everyone. I'm hearing in the cafeteria, the kids are excited for the Super Bowl, not for the game, but if they win, they're all excited to go to the parade and party and celebrate and acting like it's not even, it's not even a big deal. It's just, it's just culturally like, accepted. So you see this every day. When they say it's not a big deal, obviously their parents have told them this is a bad idea, and you've told them how. <laughs> what do you think that brings, how does that well, And, and, and it, I know it's happening in other schools as well. So it has to be a message from the adults, not just by being told don't do it, but you have to also exhibit your own responsible behaviors. And that's how the kids learn. Well, like I know some people that have high school kids and they're letting them have party and drink at their house because they're like, oh, I'd rather have them here at my house than you know, out and about. And Absolutely. they're letting them do those kinds yeah, my, my answer to that always is, I mean, if you want to let your child do that in your home, that, that's fine. That's completely legal. But what gives them the right to allow my child to drink in their home? You know, and that, that's what really kind of drives me crazy because, you know, as police officers in the schools, we're saying, you know, don't do it. The schools will tell them not to do it. And then you have that one parent that's letting them do it. Everything that we're telling them is just completely washed away. You know, it's really frustrating more than anything else. So how do we help them as a parent that we don't want that to happen? I know we've, like, my family has put in... I just have a middle schooler, but we've talked already about, you know, that when you go someplace and you feel uncomfortable, the star, you know, text, you text me a star and I will call you immediately and make up an excuse that I have to come and get you. And, you know, you tell them, oh, you know, this happened, blah, 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 I've got to go. Um, but, you know, what, are there other ways that we can help them with that when they're there at those situations where, okay, we've said no, but this parent is like, yeah, it's okay. Well, just like in the presentation, um, great points are made about knowing who your friends are. And unfortunately, in today's society, you got to know who the parents are too. And you, you, you know, you have to also say these are homes you have to stay away from. Once a kid leaves a home, you check them. It's, you know, okay, well, whose house you come from? You've been drinking. How did you get the alcohol? And then you, you have to keep digging because it's not always, it's not necessarily a bad influence from a kid. It could be a parent that's allowing this. And they might think they have the best of intentions, but at the school, we definitely make it a point to let them know you are not um, exempt from being charged criminally. You're not exempt from being in trouble just because you're in the presence of an adult. The adults not only charge for um, contributing to minors, but you're still in charge of you know, being charged with possession. So we do try to give that point that it's not just a, like a safe house if you're there. The other thing too, I would tell you as a parent, you need to speak up for those other parents and tell them to knock it off. Okay, I, I get really perturbed and I've already, by the end of hopefully before summer hits, my game plan is to go to every single parking lot in the town of Hingham and post it that no alcohol consumption is allowed in the parking lot per the bylaw. I am sick and tired of adults going to a high school football game, sitting in the parking lot thinking they're at the Patriots game or other places. They do this all the time. They're doing it at at the, at the Little League games, why is it that we have to have a glass of wine or a, or a drink when we go to some children's events? So when parents see this, the parents need to say, knock this stuff off. This is not where it belongs. Because I think the doctor had a slide here that said the acceptance of alcohol. And I think in the last couple, uh, the last risk, uh, risk behavior thing that was done in the schools, it showed that kids do not see this as bad because the parents don't. So if you want to send a message to your kids, you need to be the example. 
I'm not answering it, Christy. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Glenn. Um, I, I think it's really important that, you know, this, this kind of work in changing the culture of a town is really, really challenging and really, really important. And it begins with a group of, group of parents. It also begins working with the coalition to get out and change and educate parents on how important role modeling is in the life of a child. And that is a key thing. Also, there is a social host law and the liability of providing that. Um, so uh, that whole thing started with a, a very bad incident in Cohasset about 20 years ago in a, in a graduation party. And that social host law you know, has some teeth and it's really important. But I would tell you the culture is the same in my town. It's the same in every town that we need to really get smart and role model and hold other parents accountable if they're doing these kinds of things. So, I mean, I'm really strong, and I can't say that my, I didn't find bags of beer cans behind bushes in my house, and I had a basement. And uh, so I'm talking from the voice of experience here. Thank you. Um, just so, just want to introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Officer Daniel Murphy. I've been with Hingham Police since uh, 2010, and um, in that time, I've had the uh, luxury of working all three shifts. So I started working the midnight shift, midnight to 8 a.m., I did that for three years. I went to day shift, but that's eight to four. Um, did that for two years, and now I've been working evenings for two years. And in that time, um, I've never made an arrest on a juvenile under the age of 17. I'm not saying that all kids in Hingham are perfect little angels, but I think that's um, a good point to make, that this is, this is a great town. And the kids here do care, the parents care, and the community is uh, amazing. And uh, I'm proud to live here too. I grew up in this town, I live here now, and uh, I plan on staying here. So I have made arrests on juveniles though, okay? Typically they've been um, high school students, okay? Um, usually it's uh, late night and it's the drinking. The big thing that I've noticed in patrol, in the cruiser, on the streets, is drinking. Um, some, no, no, I'm, I'm saying, yeah, being at a party or just the typical one is where you find the group of kids in a parking lot with like a 12 pack, okay? They're experimenting. That's been the uh, extent of it. I don't think I've even been to a major giant party where there's a lot of binge drinking going on. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I know what, so I forget who pointed out the private parties where the kids are drinking in the basement. That's probably where the binge drinking is occurring. It's occurring in our homes. It's not occurring in the streets, it's not occurring in the woods, it's in the homes. So that's really up to us as residents here to keep an eye on that and control it, I think. Um, and also reach out to Officer Ford. I mean, he's really got his finger on the pulse of what's going on in that high school, okay? He, he, he knows what's going on. So if you have questions, I would send him an email. You know, he'll get back to you. Um, so, you know, thank you for having me. I know that um, Officer Ramsey has, um, a drug education display. Some of you might have had a chance to take a uh, look at it. If you want to ask a few questions, we can pull that up here right now and kind of go over it real quickly if you want. I know I did the Citizens Police Academy. I did that back in 2008. Actually, the chief was a lieutenant back then. He ran it with uh, Mike Perino. Uh, it was a great class. And actually, uh, Officer Ramsey and Ford were both uh, presenters in that. So I don't know if anyone here is a CPA graduate, but you should look into that as well. But Rob, do you want to uh, touch on that? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't no, that's fine. I just want to say that it might be a good time to have Mary speak to what are some of our warrant articles and then maybe yes. kind of get your thoughts on do you hear kids okay. talking about this could change, it's going to be legal, just kind of actually getting feedback from the ground of what you hear because, you know, it's important for, for us to know, but I'd like to get the feedback on that. And then maybe after we can look at some of the paragraphs. Cool. Yeah. If you don't mind. So without further ado, Mary. You really can't see that my glasses. Oh, Mary, thank you, Mary. So I can talk to you about some of the proposed warrant articles that will relate to marijuana um, coming up at town meeting in April. So I just want to say one thing before Mary starts. You can talk about a hard working civil employment at my employee. I think for the past three weeks since Christmas is over, Mary has been at town hall at like ten o'clock every night at different planning board meetings and zoning board meetings, dealing with all 
the articles and everything else. So we're going to try to get you out of here a little bit yeah. early tonight, okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Chief knows that because he's around working too, I just have to say. So thank you so much for having me. My name is Mary Savage Dunham. I'm the Director of Community Planning for the Town of Hingham. So if you have any questions after I'm done or if you think of something later in the week, please reach out to me. I know that um, we want to get back to these officers, so I will very quickly go over uh, what is Town Hall doing about the legalization of marijuana? So back in 2012, we were talking about medical marijuana, 2013, and how do we handle that as a community? And fast forward to 2017, the laws have been changing so quickly that it's a whole new world. And as municipal officials, we're looking at it from the angle of it's a use, how do we regulate and control that use? And um, I will tell you that we currently have been spending a lot of time talking about this. Medical marijuana is legal in town. It's regulated, but we do allow it in certain zones. So we have four uh, planning board. When I say we, I'm talking about the planning board. We have four zoning articles that will be before you at town meeting this year, I believe. And they're all related to the um, regulation of marijuana. And one of them is about medical marijuana. Very quickly, I will just say that we have existing rules in our bylaw about where medical marijuana can be located and how the business would look and operate. And because the legislation has changed so quickly, we're proposing just some cleanup changes to the medical marijuana regulations. And that's really just to cite the proper legislation. I mean, all the laws have changed. All of the um, agencies that oversee it are changing right before our eyes. and. Um, one of the things that we talk about a lot with the chief and with the planning board and the board of selectmen is the fact that the state regulations on, we call it um, recreational marijuana, which may not be the best term because it makes it sound fun or it's, you know, so I try to say retail marijuana, but most of the time you'll hear recreational marijuana. And the state's regulations won't even be final until March 1st. So municipalities like Hingham are in a position of knowing that recreational marijuana is legal and that stores will be able to start opening up this spring, summer. And if we do not have regulations in our zoning bylaw, it's a retail use. And if we don't say where it can and cannot go, somebody could theoretically walk into town hall to open a, a retail business and where could that retail business go if we don't you know regulate it it could go any place that we have retail sales you know any that could be all over town it could be downtown derby street shipyard um, lincoln street so this is an important matter for the planning board and the board of selectmen and and hopefully for the town now hingham voted no so we were a no community for recreational marijuana. And that's an important distinction because if we choose to, before 2019, the town can vote to ban retail marijuana sales in town. And so in fact, one of the articles that both the selectmen and the planning board have drafted is a ban on the retail sales of marijuana in town. Now, the Attorney General has told us that it's best to have belt and suspenders, that the selectmen should have a general bylaw and we should have a zoning bylaw if the town chooses to ban retail sale of marijuana. And so we're proceeding down that path. However, a zoning article at town meeting, without getting too technical, requires a two-thirds majority of those who are present. So that's a fairly high bar. General bylaws only require a simple majority. It's the zoning bylaw that really controls the use. So that's very important for people that have an opinion one way or the other, please come participate in town meeting because your vote matters. Um, now the planning board is concerned about this topic and, and really wants to offer different choices to the community. What do we do if the ban doesn't get the two thirds majority? If we don't have anything in place, and then the ban doesn't pass, then we're back to square one, where it's a retail use and it could theoretically locate any place. And so the planning board said, okay, let's think about the strategy a little bit. We'll advance a ban 
and that's what the planning board to date has supported the most strongly. However, if that ban didn't pass, or if the community felt that they wanted retail sales, the responsible second choice is to develop a time, place, and manner regulation. And that's a bylaw that the town would be asked to vote on that says you can sell marijuana or marijuana products, edibles, um, also, I mean, more products than you even realize, as the chief was saying. But you can do it in only these locations subject to these rules. And so we actually have a draft time, place, and manner bylaw that we've been working on. It has um, security provisions for the police. It has looks at all the potential negative impacts with regard to traffic and customers and hours of operation. So if the ban doesn't pass, we're hopeful to have a time, place, and manner regulation on the book. That will say where it can and cannot be sold. What happens if that doesn't pass? <laughs> then where are we? Uh, the planning board thought that if the town chose not to advance the ban and it didn't pass a town meeting, and a time, place, and manner regulation didn't pass a town meeting, they have a third option, and that's really kind of a, a second fail safe and that's simply a modest change to some definitions in our zoning bylaw which would preclude the sale of marijuana um, at the farmers market because marijuana is agricultural it could be at the farmers market um, it would take it out of being cons considered a home occupation and take it out of the light industrial zone so that that's our third you know option out there as far as the selectmen, they have two potential bylaws pending. One is the ban. Their ban mirrors the ban that the zoning or the planning board has drafted. They also have a backup plan. If the town chooses not to ban uh, the sale of retail marijuana, the town has the option of imposing up to a 3% tax, kind of like the meals tax, but it's the pot tax and it would be a revenue stream and so but you have to vote on that so they are also considering a, a potential tax and um, I will tell you as far as scheduling goes this is perfect timing so thank you for having me the planning board has been working very diligently our next public hearing is Monday night and the planning board will hopefully be um, trying to get down to the granular details of the time, place, and manner bylaw, as well as the other three. Um, I will also just hop back for a minute. The planning board is looking at establishing buffer zones. So if there are retail pot stores in town, you can theoretically apply buffer zones around places children congregate, um, schools, churches, daycares, that type of thing. Um, the state regulations say 500 foot buffers. The town could apply more stringent buffers if they chose to. So we're currently looking at that too. We have some maps where we've applied these buffer zones to see what does it mean. Um, you can't really zone it out of town unless you ban it. So you have to try to balance how you're um, managing the regulations. So please come participate. We have planning board Monday night. Uh, we'll be working on that. If you have questions about the language of the planning board articles before town meeting, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Please participate in town meeting. The selectmen will be having public hearings on their two articles. I don't believe that they're scheduled yet, um, but they should be coming up probably mid to late February. They're working on that now, so you could watch their agendas. And um, I know speaking for the planning board, we want to hear from you. So if you have an opinion and you can't get out Monday night, please send in your comments. You can email them to us. You know, go on the record, let us know what you would like, and all those comments will go to the planning board. Okay? Just Mary, I think uh, you can go on the Hingham website. Um, if you go, yes. is anyone familiar or gone to the Hingham website? If you go on that uh, and you click under government. Nothing in here. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> You click on the government uh, and you'll get a, I don't know what you call it, like a sub-screen and you can move over to planning board and it will have different cases, the zoning boards. So if you ever want to look up projects or what's going on with those different boards, the materials, the comments, the maps and all that kind of stuff are over there and I believe all this marijuana material is on there. 
they do a good job of transferring it over there for access. So go to the town website, government, and you get a click down box on your left, and it has a different board. So that material, if you want to print it out or look at it, is available to you. So thank you. Question from area? For me. Oh. Yeah, um, with, regard, <laughs> with regard to retail marijuana, is there an age limit like for alcohol <coughs> to be 21 or older to buy it? Is it the same thing for marijuana as well? It's going to be 20, 21. 21. It's going to be 21. Um, and this is, you know, I, I was thinking what Mary said is that just when we say recreational marijuana, we all know how words can tell you so much. I really prefer the term retail. You're 100% right, because that's what it really is. It's retail, and people are making money. Um, so I think we just got to be careful and you know read this stuff over and educate yourselves as consumers, because I think most people don't really know what this market is really all about. Um, but back to uh, the the stuff that I guess the guys are finding. I guess Dan, want to jump in? everyone for coming out and maybe leave it a little time at the end because we do have a hard stop at the library which we're all aware of to you know talk to the police see what's actually going on and just again to strongly emphasize if you're from a different town I can't emphasize enough how important it is to have a partnership if you are involved with your CPAC or any other special needs organization I think tonight we really saw and maybe think about these risks in a little bit different way and how our children are at it is such incredible risk, all children, but especially if you have ADHD or any of the other umbrella um, diagnoses, which they don't ever go hand, they always hand in hand. Um, it's so important, and I really just encourage, if you're from another town, start to talk to your police. Can they do a form online where responding officers will be able to know if the child has a disability when they come to the home? Um, you know, don't be scared to ask. And the, the question of when do you start talking to your child about drugs, I have two young boys, um, one of which probably both have ADHD. And I think if you've ever taught or worked with children with ADHD, you cannot say it enough because they do tend to um, wake up, as Ned Hallowell says, with a blank slate. And you have to keep telling them again and again and again. And they will act like they never heard it before. And they kind of didn't. So don't, don't, you know, you do have to be so active and get engaged. And, you know, I can't thank you enough for this presentation. It really has me thinking about what I'm going to do differently. Um, and I, you know, thank the police. It's, again, it takes everybody working together. Um, and, you know, I think the schools are great resources. You need to get the teachers involved. You need to tell them what you're seeing and be honest about it. There's nothing to be ashamed of. The more, you know, partnerships you have, the better your children and you'll be as a sane parent. Do you have a question, Jamie? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks, Dan. Dr. Murphy, do you feel there's a benefit in... Sorry, sorry what? Do you feel there's a benefit in doing a presentation like this to a middle school yeah. student body? Or is that, I mean, you don't want to pull out and say, okay, well, this is special education. And, but how do you kind of make this awareness for... Uh, I, I, that's a hard... Absolutely. I mean, we're talking about starting, you know, opening up all doors and having a uh, transparent conversation around the issues. And I just had a session earlier today with one of my clients, and he drives a Mustang. You can hear him coming. So guess what slide, guess what, you know, what risk factors I started to share with him around driving and what the research shows. <laughs> Yeah, just as an FYI, just to build his awareness that, yes, he likes to go fast, but part of this journey is building awareness, right? And, and not being afraid to have hard conversations and, and see where it goes. I have a question. I don't know if this is relevant in, in Duxbury. I actually grew up in Duxbury. Um, my peer group had a lot of kids that had a lot of substance abuse problems. So. I'm always wondered, like, when my kids are surrounded by kids who are struggling with substance abuse, and I know I watched it, what resources do the kids have to be able to communicate that to people to maybe get their friend help at a younger age? So you're talking about community resources? Because that's where I would start. I would start with the community resource officers and and pediatricians and start to... But as a kid, so say yeah. you have friends around you that are struggling with substance abuse, 
You mention it to their friends and they all look at you like, their kids are having fun. You talk to their parents and their parents are like, whatever. So I know this is a personal thing for me because the person that I dated through high school overdosed when he was in his late 20s. And when he was 17, he was addicted to alcohol. And I, as his girlfriend, tried to help, but I couldn't get anybody to help me because I didn't know where to go or what to do. <laughs> Thank you for that segue. You know, a lot is going on, and um, in some of the meetings with CARE, I know um, one of the issues, and I think the school about maybe Dot, you, you want to talk about that testing? I, I saw something in the paper. Uh, the screening, the screening that the school department's doing. Yes, the mandated testing. So they're doing it for seventh and ninth grade students. Yes. So one of the things that's open to discussion right now is, okay, we do, the school's going to do this testing, but you need to have resources lined up. So we're hoping to get some resources lined up. The school department's hoping to get resources. I know one of the things that uh, the Hingham Police Department did, uh, we, there's an organization called Perry, which started up on the North Shore with the opioid, uh, the opioid problems. We were able to get two recovery coaches that work with us. Uh, one of them is here tonight, hiding behind the pole over here, Kurt. <laughs> so Kurt walk, works uh, 20 hours a week for us, um, or, or any, basically any other police department or anybody in the town of Hingham that needs, needs them. So we are trying to reach out and get these people lined up that you can go and get help with or it put you people in touch with somebody. Um, so Kurt, do you just want to introduce yourself? Or, but we're hoping that he will be a resource. I'm putting him on the spot, but he works very hard. I think, what do you make, $250 that we pay you every year? <laughs> <laughs> I think he figured it out. What was it, about two bucks an hour? Yeah, it's a volunteer job. It's a volunteer <laughs> job, pretty much. Um, I didn't really even prepare anything. I'm, I'm just, a, I guess, my role with, with the police is I'm a recovery coach. Um, one thing we do is we go uh, visit people who have recently overdosed and we try to get them within a certain time period, within 12 to 24 hours, that seems to be the window that they're most respect, receptive. Um, but the mo, I mean, and I do that a lot in the rest of Plymouth County, but up here, Hingham Hull, well, Hingham Hull area, really, pretty much, I'm doing a lot of work with at-risk individuals, um, people who are, might not have overdosed or might not be in the system yet, but who are struggling with substance use disorder and uh, just trying to get them the services that they need. Because um, if I heard you correctly, there, there's not a many resources or... Well, for kids to feel like they can say, look, I have a friend struggling yeah. Yeah. who needs help. Yeah, and that's, I mean, and that's also the stigma. And I know everyone here knows about the stigma. Um, you know, we can't speak about this because this is, uh, you know... This is a bad thing, or what? And well, some of the consequences of it, yes, they are negative, and they are they do come out in uh, certain behaviors that are not acceptable. But um, the fact that you're able to sit here and say that now today, and it is, I think it's a great step forward, and that we're all able to sit here and say, hey, I have this person in my family, or I have this, and it's we need to break that stigma, so we're able to finally get the people the help that they need. So I don't know. Can you guess where his accent is from? <laughs> Go ahead. You know, I just, I just wanted to say that one of the things that, um, and I, I know Dot in your school system, and I know in our school, school system, when you look at the YRBS surveys, youth risk behavior surveys, that it's really important for the students to have a trusted adult that they can confide in mm -hmm. and uh, and a trusted teacher that they can confide in. And I know in Cohasset the, the rates of that kind of trust level were very high and I know in Hingham they were very high. And so um, I think you'd be surprised that these teachers are ready, willing and able to listen. They have the credibility of the students, as do the stu uh, school resource officers have a, play a terrific role in, in trying to help guide that. So those would be the, the couple of places that I would go in the school system. And, you know, there's been a big turnaround when it comes to headset and thinking uh, with substance use disorder. Uh, and, you know, you look at, they used to arrest them, you know, hang them, hang them high. And now it's like, how do we get them help? Mm -hmm. And it, you never thought you'd see that kind of turnaround in behavior from, from everybody. So 
Mm -hmm. uh, that that's where I would look, and and I'll tell you, it's proven in in the schools that there are those teachers. And more and more of that is becoming available as the police uh, in Plymouth County. We're participating in what they call the Plymouth PCO, Plymouth County Outreach. Um, they're doing drop-in centers. I mean, we're hoping eventually to get one up in this area. So the, the resource, I mean, we've changed. We're working on changing, not us, but through the CARES and these other regional groups that have been springing up. You know, and I, I try to tell people that it, with the lack of government doing anything, it's forced police and social, you know, social people and, and grassroots people to fill in the void. And people have been doing a really good job doing that. So we hope that that stigma is really going away. And I think you'll find that, you know, like you're probably, what, 18 now? You're 17? So, you know, <laughs> the, a lot has changed over the years, and I think you'd see a big difference. People are a lot more accepting now. It's not the and, – and it's still a long way to go, though, so. Question for these guys. Just do you find that you're dealing with some students that are in denial, like they have a problem and they're not uh, recognizing it, or their parents are in denial? And if so, how do you deal with that? I definitely see that with uh, marijuana use. The, the, the common thing is kids spend, there are some kids in that school that spend a large amount of their time talking to me defending marijuana and tell me how, you know, you're wasting your time. It's good for you. It's, it's medically, it helps you. And wherever they got this information from, obviously, I mean, it's, it's, it's not from us. It's not from, hopefully not from their parents. And they're getting this information that it's, and a lot of it's actually through social media. And that's why being aware of your social media, if you ever go on Facebook and see all the articles that pop up, you see all this information that's not always completely accurate. Where are they getting their information from? So social media, seeing what's on their phone, seeing where they're learning some of the, these um, things from, that's important. But a lot of the times they don't think it's an issue. With alcohol, there are kids in the school that are at, at risk for alcoholism. I, I'm not sure the statistic, what is it, like if you start drinking at 16 uh, or like under 16? 35 percent chance of being an alcoholic, I believe. Yeah, yeah so, so about a third. Yeah. and we have kids as young freshmen that are actively drinking every week, and, 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 and the rates of um, them becoming an alcoholic are much higher. They don't, they deny it because it's a part of high school culture. It's a part of, you know, it's, all the kids are doing it. This is what we do. We're have, you know, we're enjoying our youth. And these can become big problems later on. So something we have to keep in check and not just accept it as high school kids being high school kids. And we have to identify it as soon as you can. Where, where do you think they're getting, like, I, when I was that age, would have, like, a cousin buy beer for A lot of kids have fake IDs. A lot of kids have them. They're not, they're not very, and they're not very good, they, but stories are accepting them. So. It's called the World Wide Web for a reason. I mean, they get everything online. Technology is just so advanced. And drugs, too? Is that where they would find, like, pot? Or? No, pot, believe it or not. Um, the, well, like I said, mo mo I get, most kids are really good kids. It's just a small But the, the few that I've seen with marijuana so far, it's, believe it or not, th th grown at home. The way the, the way the laws change in Massachusetts, people think it's no big deal, and that's what's scary. I mean, I have middle school kids saying it like Tom's. They think it's legal. It's medicine. I'm like, it's not. <laughs> in the other hands, it's very very destructive because it's a growing brain. Their brain's gonna grow till like almost 25. You know, and, and it can be destructive. We, so everyone hears about marijuana and maybe enjoying, and I feel probably willfully ignorant about. Could we maybe look at what? How do they do it? They're not smoking necessarily. What does it look like? Right. Even something like, what does it smell like? Because it doesn't smell, it doesn't smell, or it has other, yeah. we just... Yeah, this is a, yeah, this is a jewel. It's the latest thing right now. Um, as you can see, it's so small, they can hold it right in their hand. You wouldn't even know. They, they can slide up their sleeve and they tuck it right in their pocket. And they have to have, they have to be like a certain age to buy them. They, well, they're supposed to, but you get them online. They can lie about the age. Yeah. And the thing is, too, with, yeah, with the jewel, it, it, yeah, yeah, everything dot com. I know, yeah. You know, you want it, get it, dot com. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, if you, if you notice, it, lo it looks like a cartridge. In fact, um, when these first came out, uh, we, were, we, we have monthly meetings with the court and other school um, um, administrators in the Plymouth County, like the Hingham District Court uh, area. And uh, from another town, one of the administrators said the first time she saw one of these, she thought it was a USB port and gave it back to the kid. You know, yeah, it was cra it's crazy. Um, but what's, what we're seeing actually uh, is like the cartridge right here that you can get with nicotine and other chemicals. Um, that they say it's flavored, but it's all artificially flavored. Uh, 
What goes in there? I mean, is it a liquid? Yeah, it's a liquid. But what we're seeing from the marijuana retailers is that you can get the THC liquid, which is marijuana, uh, in these, and that's, you can use it with the, the vapes and the jewels. You can actually, if you have that Irmont thing, you can look at there, it's like 50 or $60 or something yeah. like that, cartridge. Wow. That is amazing. How long does that work? It's also orderless, too. Thanks for the effort. Yeah, it's, it's, you can't, yeah, you really can't tell unless you're right on top of a person using it. Is there a sound? Would you say you're right on top of it? So how no. would you know? I mean, you see it. You get, it, it, it smells a little bit like air freshener and maybe a little puff of smoke, and that's it. It's gone. Okay. It, 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 it's vapor is what the kind of direct sound. And how long would that stay in someone's that's the this, this, this is brain. Yeah, the problem with the problem with a lot of kids, like at least with the dare program, uh, these were only about five years old. They really exploded maybe a year or two ago. So you got that the older high school kids. We never discussed this. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at the smoking trends. It was going down and down and down. The tobacco industry is loving this stuff because studies are showing once a kid gets hooked on this, mm -hmm. within a year they're on real cigarettes. Mm -hmm. So that's going to probably go up too, unfortunately. Um, but you know, I'm sorry, what was the? Um, you, you obviously said there's a little puff of smoke. You smell it. What would be the symptoms? Like if you see, is it dilated eyes? Is it no. similar to traditional no, it's, it's marijuana? Just, yeah, no, no, yeah, nothing so really. How do you know if they're using it if you don't see it? You got, you got to catch, get your hands off them. You got to catch them doing it. Well. In, in the moment. In the moment, yeah. Those those yes. cartridges like they take up to the bathroom and, yeah. and it's like one kid's going to the bathroom and they're the little ones and they're passing them off. Yeah. So like if you if yeah. you catch a kid coming out of the bathroom um, and you just caught them doing something and they have nothing on it because they just switched off to someone else that's going into the bathroom. Yeah. So Yeah, this is this is the biggest it's yeah. stuff and stuff to get yeah, let's rent off them. Yes, in the back. So when I was in high school, kids used to smoke tobacco. Yes. And they secondhand smoke. Is there it's like any type of secondhand? Um, the study, they said it's new. The long term effects are out there, but they're starting to see. It's saying like I'm in close proximity to, to Tom and Dan. They're breathing in that vapor, and and they believe that it's a form of secondhand smoke. But again, it's a little too early to get the long term effects. Uh, but as far as cancer, I think I saw online. In fact, I posted on the Ingham Dare Facebook page. Uh, NYU did a study, and it's shown that there are carcinogens in this, that it is causing cancer. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I'll turn another hand. So the, um, the concern with this, and again, kids are saying, you know, it's not a big deal, it's not causing any harm, but um, the, this, with the um, legalization of marijuana, with pot shops being open, the ability and the access to get the THC cartridges for these, uh, much higher. And um, combining the THC oils, it's not like um, with you know smoking a joint where they're able to regulate their intake. When they start with the edibles and they start with being able to access this during the school day, you're going to have a lot bigger problems. And when you combine the use of um, you know marijuana products, THC, with their Adderall medication or other prescribed medications, uh, there can be adverse medical effects to that. And this is going to be a big problem in the schools because kids trying, you know, trying a hit of this or, you know, eating something they don't know what it is, combined with their medication, the increase in medical issues at the school are going to go through the roof. Yeah, so there is a large danger of some a child that is on ADHD medicine and then takes some type of really anything. Yeah. Yeah, we just had an issue up at the uh, Collaborative High School uh, two weeks ago, I believe. Someone brought marijuana cookies in and a couple of kids ate it and next thing they're being rushed off to South Shore Hospital. Had a bad reaction to it. So those kids need to be really, you know, I mean, it's informed and aware, and we've talked about it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the key is, is to be involved with your child's life. You know, talk to them about it. Um, you know, just just be a part. Know where they're going, know who they're hanging with, know where the parents are. Um, it's just kind of, you know, be on top of them, know what's going on. We talk about stuff you're seeing on the street as well, and talking with the detectives before I came over here. More and more products are being mixed with other products. Um, you know, I think. We worried about PCP being put into marijuana. But believe it or not, people are actually sprinkling, sprinkling fentanyl and cow fentanyl on, on a marijuana. It, it's why these people, I mean, why would you eat a Tide pot of soap? I have no idea, but, you know, why do, people's, why do people inhale gas? Why do they do vapors? I, you know, there's so many things that inhalants continues to be a problem. Um, a very popular inhalant, by the way, would be the stuff you clean your computer off with? Mm -hmm. Yeah.
That was you know? yeah, the key, little keyboard. Yeah. So if your kid has a really clean keyboard and 10 things beside the keyboard, you better be looking at what's going on. There's a great program that's going on, and we'll, we'll try to get it here, but it's, it's a thing that you walk through the house. What's the name of it, Christine? Hidden in plain sight. Hidden in plain sight that basically is a room set up with all these places that kids use for hides. We're going we're gonna to have it implemented at our health fair yeah. on the 25th, and uh, I know Kristen was going to schedule it. We have our own kit, and I know Kristen was going to schedule it here in Hingham, too. Yeah. Yes. I, I know. Um, we set I up a teen bedroom and have all sorts of hidden trucks and to, to shock you. We've got <coughs> our own, and um, it's pretty cool. You know, and, and we're, you know, every parent, every, if, if you don't think that I'm not affected by this, you know, um, when we were in Florida, I brought my son, this great alligator head at the alligator farm, and that was always on his bureau, and he had like pulled out the velvet, carved it back, and had a little stash hidden behind there. <laughs> you know, it's like I would never look at an alligator head for finding the stash. I mean, these kids are ingenious, you know? So um, I, I think we talked about the bedroom, definitely a dangerous space for kids. My son tried locking himself in the bedroom, told me he owned the bedroom. I went down with my electric drill. I, I told him I owned the door. Uh, and I took the door. And, you know, he got the message. Um, so I always found, like, sometimes you just, I'm not advocating that you take the kids' doors down, but I, I've never been a fan of my father. Never, you, you couldn't shut a door in my house. The only door that shut was the bathroom door. Um, you know, bedrooms are a dangerous place. Yeah, the bedroom, that's the, the child's, that's their safe spot. Like, when I was growing up, I can't speak for every mother, but I never knew how to do laundry because my mother did our laundry because that's her reason to get into the room so, so you could search everything. You know, I didn't know at the time, but looking back, that was the reason. So, yeah. Work, worked in the Ramsey house, so that's all I know. <laughs> so, uh, to buy the, the uh, vaping stuff, like, is that, like, cigarettes? Is it is 21 it's for vaping? Yeah. That's, a good, that's what you're trying to figure out. Here in Hingham, you have to be 19 to purchase tobacco products. I, I, is vaping? Yeah, that's... We did, we, we did yeah. both of them at 21. We moved it up to 21 last year or the year before, I think. So, so that's by with chance. The, with the jewels, to yeah. be um, what it is is if you go online, there's a, a very extensive way to go in. You have to be 21, and, and they vet you through. It's actually pretty good. Um, and Anne Marie and Situate... She'll, tell, she'll trip you or she knows all about it, but um, what the kids are doing, they'll buy a Visa gift card and then go on to like Amazon or, or eBay or buy them that way. Yeah, they're, they're very sneaky. The other thing is, do I, does everybody know here what the dark web is? Oh, I've heard of it on TV. What? <laughs> on TV. <laughs> what is it? They talk about it on TV. <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard it talk about it on TV. I, gu I guarantee you a lot of your kids know how to get there. Sure. So what is it? The, the dark web is where all the dirty stuff happens. It's a whole other web out there that exists that kids know how to get onto, that you don't know how to get onto. Uh, I don't know how to get onto it. My detectives know how to get onto it. They haven't told me yet. I, no. <laughs> yeah. Chief, I don't want to cut that. I know Dan want to give some time. It's about a quarter of that clock's right. I don't know if you want to kind of... We should get questions and come look at some stuff. I don't want to ruin dialogue, yeah. but I, I wanted people yeah. to have some opportunity to talk. Actually, to you know, I just one one quick thing I want to show everybody real quick. And the chief just uh, pointed point this out to me. Uh, I made an arrest I don't know, like a year ago. So like, like what does this like look like to you? I have that yeah. 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 Like it looks like a bottle of lemonade. Okay. So this is like an it's an edible. It's actually it's mango juice. Yeah. It's uh it's a marijuana product. So I mean. That's, no, yeah, this, is, this, this is lemonade. Yeah, the, the, problem, the problem, what I'm saying with this, when people tell you that there'll be no black market in the marijuana industry, um, I'm sure there's some business people in here. All right, you open a shop, you pay employees, you pay taxes, you do this, you do that, you add 3% on. Yeah. Everything that a business has to pay, for every $15, you pay an employee five of that, you get to pay an additional $5 in benefits. All right, the consumer ends up paying that. Now the town wants to add in 3%, the state wants to add in their taxes. You're going to be able to sell marijuana cheaper. This stuff here is being manufactured who knows where, well, that's, that's whose garage. Bought so this, this was, was that's bought on the Insta Instagram, someone told the me. The gentleman who got this, he drove, the, he drove to Colorado, where it's legal, and he bought uh, three cases <laughs> and that, that I know of. Because that's what we got when I grabbed it. 
but he also had about a quarter pound of uh, raw marijuana, just the, the actual weed itself. Um, but this was after he had been reported selling it in a neighborhood area. In the Hang like the yes, drive? so he was selling this out of his car. So what happened was, it was actually a high school student, he was a high school student, saw that car, it was a student at Tom Ford's, okay, so he recognized a car coming into a spot, meeting with someone, going for a ride, coming back. He was doing this for a whole weekend. So the kid finally called us on a Monday and said, hey, this car's out here going back and forth, meeting someone and leaving. I sat there, I waited for about 10 minutes. Sure enough, he pulled right in, another car came in. They got together, I saw the transaction, and then we just moved in. And that's when I grabbed him and we picked up all this product, okay? But that was after three days. Would you I'm sorry? Have, you know you can tell if somebody's been drinking? If you yeah. drank that, is there a, an odor that it gives off? Or no. you can just bring that full and it can No, be this, this just smells like lemonade. Yeah, it, they use what they're using is the THC oils that they extract from the plant. Um, so, and how they do that, they have a uh, we saw in the there's like a five hundred thousand dollar machine they use that uses purified gases and everything else that forces it through the marijuana product, and the oils in a plant like all plants and vegetables have oils, they come out. You can also go online and buy the kits to do it, and you just go to your local hardware stores or your local Tedeschi's, or if they have Tedeschi's anymore, man. <laughs> they all vanished out of Hingham, but uh, you can buy, guess what they're using? Butane. Mm -hmm. Butane is explosive, last time I checked. You use it for lighters. They're taking butane and filtering it through the marijuana to make the THC oil. So how healthy could that be? Now, if you're really good at this, you can actually find some butane that's actually marked that it's more medical, better medical grade, okay? No one cares about, so the butane companies are marketing for this reason as well. They're making money off of this. Everybody's making money, it's amazing. But we need to stop these things because it's, there's no, you don't know what's in those products. You don't know how they made that. You don't know how they got the oils. I certainly don't wanna have something that they use butane. And this is, by the way, when people are making this in their houses, this is why you hear about people exploding and get catching on fire. Um, pot grow places are all done indoors. Nothing gets grown from a seed anymore. It's all hydroponics and it's all grafting. They, they clone them. They don't grow from the seeds anymore. It's technology. You can go to Harvard or Yale and they'll have recruiting classes and they're bringing in botanists. It's a whole new profession that the colleges are now making money on. So I, I keep on saying it, this is money, totally money. It's not about the marijuana, it's not the miracle cure. I'm sure it helps some people, I don't doubt that. If someone's 80 years old and they want to smoke some marijuana, I could care less. You know, they have a disease, I, I can say that's fine. But this is not the miracle cure that most people, there's TV shows now that are marketing it. Christine, when I get, finally get the tape back to her, there's a wonderful tape about how the cigarette, cigarette industry um, basically hooked everybody on cigarettes because they marketed them to soldiers. Mm -hmm. They went off to war and said, every soldier needs a pack of cigarettes. And then when they, people started saying it was bad, they said, we'll have doctors advertise it. And doctors would get on there and tell you about, this is really good for you. And then it just kept on going that they way. They were losing weight. They would have Virginia yeah. Slims mm -hmm. and these things. And so everything was marketed. And there's a big parallel between the marijuana yeah. industry, the big marijuana industry, and the big tobacco yeah. industry. So, But, you know, I mean, I, I think we can go on. So I just urge people, and I, you really, so as you come out, you can see some of that stuff up there. Um, you really do need to educate yourself, and I think I'm glad to be working with the schools and the special, the special needs because I think I really see, you know, they are, you know, someone that could really easily be swayed or, or just need those type of things because they're looking, uh, they don't feel good in society, so they try to self-medicate maybe. So I think we really got to keep a close eye and, you know, we've got to reach out as a society and just say we're here to help. We don't, we, it's not about the stigma, we want to help you. And if you see a problem, you need to identify it and talk about it, no matter what the age. Well, uh, thank you. I thank everyone for coming out. A little time, a little. Thrown out of a library. Yeah. So. <laughs> I don't know about that.
Um, please go up and look. And I want to, again, thank everybody. I think this is really thought provoking. And I, I think I could see a follow up to this. Okay? Yeah. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you.